Hi everyone, welcome back to the OTCM workshop. I'm Chris again, and in this, the second video in the series, we're going to be looking at the construction of the baseboards for my new exhibition layout. Last time out, we looked at the prototype history behind the layout, the idea behind it, and in this one, we're going to make the first moves towards actually constructing something. Uh, as you can see, the baseboards are alongside me. These are the scenic boards. They're all constructed. And in this video, we're going to take a trip back in history, a couple of months uh, to when I was constructing them, We'll take a look at how they were done. So before we get started, we obviously need some wood. Always helpful to have some wood to start off building baseboards. And what we're going to do is quickly mark up uh, some strips that act as the, uh, the cross braces running across the layout. For all the baseboards, I've used a 10 centimetre deep frame and a 9 mil ply uh, to act as the actual framework itself. The reason for 10 centimetres being the depth I've used is that it gives plenty of space for point motors, uh, any other electrical equipment to sit underneath the layout and not have to worry about anything hanging out the bottom when moving the layout around. So with the strip marked up it's time to crack out the circular saw and uh, we'll whiz across and uh, get this strip cut off. Worth saying I'm far from being the world's best carpenter. Uh, you should probably be using a straight edge to rest the saw against which will give a better finish uh, but this has been uh, satisfactory. I'm sure a professional carpenter would have a heart attack if they looked at it, at the way I work. Um, but from my perspective, it's pretty decent. I should probably also say excuse the slightly dodgy DIY haircut. I was actually building these baseboards in lockdown, so I was unable to go to the barbers. So it is a proper homemade haircut, as well as homemade baseboards. So with that cut, we'll do the official hold it up in the air, look down the edge, make sure it's straight. Looks pretty decent, I think. So uh, we'll put that one off over into the store and we'll uh, repeat the process for the number of cross pieces we need. Going for one roughly every foot. Of course, when building baseboards, it's always important to measure as you go, not try and measure everything up in advance and then cut it. Because you'll realize that nothing fits because you've failed to take account of the width of the saw blade. I'll let you guess how I learnt that. So with everything cut, it was quickly laid out on top of the baseboard top just to make sure everything fitted and was cut to the right size. And then I'm going to start marking it up, ready to cross drill some holes through these boards, ready for wiring runs and to keep the weight down. So with the centre line of the framework all marked up, I'm then going along and making a mark at the centre points for each hole I want to drill, using a 50mm hole cutter. So I think I'm going for 100mm intervals between each hole, therefore keeping a regular spacing along the framework, keep it looking neat and tidy. And with that done, it was time to fire the drill up and get back outside in the sun, ready to drill these holes. While there's no denying that drilling all these holes through the framework takes a long time, 
it is worthwhile in my view. Firstly, because it makes your baseboards look a bit more professional than if it's solid. It makes them look a bit more like they're pro-built, which these certainly aren't. But secondly, it helps keep the weight down slightly. And it's also very handy if you're moving the boards around on your own uh, to be able to grab them on the framework and have a comfortable handhold for yourself just to ease moving around. So having gone through every bit of framework using a 4mm drill bit just to drill out pilot holes exactly in the spots I want them. I'm now going to get the hole cutter set up, which is essentially a drill bit with a saw around the outside. We'll get that mounted in the drill and then we'll start work on cutting out these holes and making them 50mm holes. Okay, so I've now got the cross pieces firmly set up in the workmate. Uh, absolutely strong case on this, otherwise the wood will rip itself out. And then I'm using the hole cutter, just running through with the drill, hopefully nice and straight uh, to keep the holes true. Only going through halfway, you'll note. Um, if you go through all the way, you rip the wood on the opposite side. So the best way to do this is to drill halfway through from one side, flip the wood over, and then we'll do the same from the opposite side and then remove the core of the hole So with the wood flipped over, they're going to start going through on the other side. Obviously using the pilot holes, we know that the hole cutter is going to line up from one side to the other. And there's a segment released. Just got to flick it out the drill and then move on to the next one. And we'll work our way across the baseboard and across each bit of frame doing the same thing, repeating it as we go. So with everything cut out now, um, just finishing it off in the video, I'm uh, gonna treat everything to a thorough sanding, and make sure there's no sharp edges, don't want anyone getting splinters. Then we'll get back into the shed and start construction. So we've got all the component parts roughly in place and I'm gonna start gluing them together, um, just running glue along the joints and then I'll pin through from the underside, uh, pin it up into the frame and make sure we've got a really solid joint. Best way to pin it is just to use some panel pins and a hammer. Um, save a bit of time, I occasionally use a nail gun, uh, which I did in this circumstance. Much safer to use a hammer, and I wouldn't recommend using a nail gun unless you're familiar with one. So just gonna pop that bit of framework in place, uh, get the glue seated between the baseboard top and the frame. Then I'm gonna grab a um, clamp and get that held in place ready for pinning. So with the side frame in place, I'm gonna move on to the cross sections. Uh, you'll note that the ones for the baseboard edge, I haven't drilled the holes in. That's just because I don't know where the bolt holes are gonna go at the moment to pass them through into each board. It seems sensible to keep those bits solid for now. So I'm gonna get this glued up now we know it fits well. Um, then we will get that pinned in place and then we'll move away on across the baseboard, get everything in place and we'll end up with a full baseboard at the end of the day. So with everything in place, I've now got two complete fiddle yard baseboards. You can see they're pretty large there at six foot by two foot each. And the value that all those holes add in being able to get your fingers through. That's a view from the underside. Uh, glue's obviously still wet in that picture, just after I've finished construction. And then with both baseboards laid out on top of the trestles, um, to get an idea of the scale, there's a loco in there. So for the scenic boards, rather than drilling the holes through them to keep the weight down, these are a bit smaller um, and I want them to be contoured to the shape of the layout, which means that the holes are impractical. So what I'm doing is just using jigsaw to cut out the approximate shape of the landscape. 
as you can see, I'm doing a pretty good job of also being ham-fisted at the same time, but we'll try and gloss over that a bit and uh, pretend we didn't see that bit. So again, to make sure everything's tidy, I'm just going to hit this with the electric sander, just make all the edges nice and rounded. I don't want any splinters, as I said earlier. Obviously constructing your baseboards in this way means you need to know roughly what the scenery is going to look like before you start constructing the baseboards. Something I was talking about in the last video, understanding exactly how you want the layout to look before you actually build it. Otherwise it wouldn't be possible to build the scenic contours into the baseboard cross members. So with everything cut to shape and sanded, everything was put together in the same way as the figure art boards and we end up with some nice looking scenic boards where the track bed is the only bit of solid top and the rest of it is all open to allow scenery to be constructed both above and below the track bed. Right, so that's the scenic baseboards more or less complete. As you can see, I've got the track bed pinned down on top of the cross members um, and the front and back members as well. Nice, simple baseboard construction, minimizes waste in duplication of wood. And hopefully you can see, if I just swing around slightly, the track bed for the sidings on the right is dropping down to a slightly lower level and then the cross members angle up to the mainline level which is slightly higher at this end. 
taking a look the other way, we've got the main line, which will be three tracks wide at this point, because we've got a head shunt. That is the main straight construction. And then we've got the industrial access line, which branches off to the rear on a separate track bed, so I can drop the scenery between them if necessary. At the moment, the front formers I've left at each end, because I'm not exactly sure on the line profile. Once this has progressed a bit further and I've got the scenic shape uh, complete, I'll obviously be looking to uh, cut that down and shape it according to the scenery. For the moment it's easier just to leave it at full height and then I can chop it afterwards. I don't want to end up cutting it down further than necessary at this point in time. And if we drop down really low, you see the front board, which is 6mm ply, is much lower than the track bed height to allow me to have the railway up on the embankment, a small stream and a canal underbridge hopefully running under there. And then that runs all the way along and gradually slopes up to come out at the other end where it's up above the track height again. I'm hoping this is going to result in a natural looking landscape. Uh, it's sort of based on the prototype area um, and it should look like the railway is being built through the landscape rather than the landscape being built around the railway, which is what we're setting out to achieve. Taking a quick look underneath, you can see there's three bolts, one at the front of the baseboard one at the rear of the baseboard and one directly onto the track bed to make sure that the two baseboards align really well. I need to add some baseboard allowment downs to this. I haven't done that yet. It's one of the things on the to-do list before I start laying track. Uh, but the three bolts on their own hold it together really tightly as is and it doesn't really need the nails. Um, I'm really adding them as a bit of security. At the rear of the layout, you can see I've got the industrial track bed, the single line one. That's running off onto this section here where it will turn right and go across onto another baseboard at the back which will be its own fill yard. It'll go through the back scene which obviously isn't fitted yet. That piece of wood that's there at the moment will be reshaped once that's laid uh, and I've got the exact formation um, just to make it look a bit more natural. Uh, I haven't filed down the back yet either so I'll attack it with some sandpaper when we get to that point um, and make sure it's all flush with the, the rear of the uh, baseboard. Now we've got the scenic boards at the front of the layout completed and the fiddle yard boards at the rear. We just need to join these together and for that we're going to need some curves. To make these I'm going to use a single sheet of 8 foot by 4 foot 9 millimeter plywood um, and I'll cut this down into approximately 1 foot wide curves and we'll segment those into quarters so they're easy enough to transport around. I've tried cutting curves in the past and it went disastrously wrong when I was using multiple sheets of wood. That's the reason why I'm using a single sheet here because we know that everything is square and both ends will be perfectly the same size at the critical points. So to mark up the curve I'm using a four foot long piece of plywood. I've just sellotaped a pencil to the end of it. Um, I mark the centre point of the wood on the straight side and then what we're doing is just working our way around gradually uh, roughly marking in the location of the edge of the baseboard. This will form the outside of the baseboard. There's probably tools available to do this in a more professional fashion, but I didn't want to do that. I've seen other people use string as well. Um, personally, string doesn't work very well for me, so I thought I'd use just this piece of wood which keeps everything solid and you can't allow the pencil to actually come in any shorter than the length of the wood. It's worth saying there's a bit of a knack to this. Um, it took me a couple of attempts to get it to be perfect all the way around. Um, part of the joy is it sort of smooths out when you actually end up cutting it. Uh, so that helps out and making it look like a professional job at the end of it. Um, as you can see from this, it's not really professional at all. So with the outside done, I'm now repeating the same process again for the inside. Uh, as this is a totally professional job, I chose the width of the baseboard off the difference between a four foot length of bit of plywood and a one meter long spirit level. This again it's just sellotaped the pencil to the end of the spirit level here and it's doing the exact same job as the wood was doing on the outer corner. So that's the inner and outer curves now marked. As you can see we've now got a nice smooth pencil line that runs 180 degrees right around the corner. Keeps consistent width all the way around. And that's a nice tidy corner to work off I think uh, to get the saw out and we'll use a circular saw to cut that a jigsaw if the corner's too tight. And that's the wood cut. We've now got a nice smooth curve. As you can see, I decided to widen this out slightly at the scenic board ends, uh, just to ease the uh, transition onto the scenic section, give me a bit more space for an extra line to come off should that be required. I thought that was a worthwhile thing, easier to build in now than later. And with all the wood cut, we can take a quick look and see how our handiwork is looking. As you can see, full circle, 
the idea of this is that it can actually be set up as a full circle as well, which is a bit more handy to use around the house, etc. Uh, so the four segments will all be able to be interlocked with one another, as well as forming the ends of the baseboards for the main layout. These are obviously quite large baseboards. Uh, it's an eight foot by eight foot circle. So pretty hefty, really. It gives me just under a four foot radius for the outside curve. And I need that because I use three link couplings on all my stock. So I can't get round corners with my locos and rolling stock anywhere near as tight as would be the case with if I was using tension locks or something similar as stock comes with from the box. With that basic shape cut out for the baseboard tops, I've then cut some framework out 6mm ply to run around the outside edges and some 9mm ply to act as cross braces to go across it. I didn't film the construction of these as it was a bit challenging having to bend the plywood uh, to fit around the outside edges of the top of the baseboards, uh, but hopefully you can see it's the same level of construction as the rest of the baseboards, the same size. As the corner baseboards are relatively narrow, I did think there was a slight danger of trains being quite close to the edge as they were running around. So as you can see, I've built in a sort of two centimetre overlap that runs over the top of the baseboard height, just to act as a barrier should something derail on its way around, which hopefully it won't do. But if the worst should happen, that should stop any stock falling down to the ground. So earlier on, we talked about the industrial track, which will drop off the rear of the layout somewhere in the middle. Uh, the line will run along here and it will sweep off through the back scene, point around about there. Obviously the back scene is not fitted yet. So to that end I've built a, another baseboard uh, while I was in woodworking mode, um, which is here. So this is going to act as the fiddle yard for the branch line. So this is going to bolt flush onto the rear of the layout. So we're going to put some bolt holes through on this trajectory. That will just bolt through the frame at the rear. Um, straight through and hold this nice and level with the rest of the layout and the back seam will sit between this and the ceiling boards. Although it seems quite small in uh, comparison to the rest of the layout, this is actually the same length as my old layout. Um, you can see there's various markings on the wood, that's just because I've used various offcuts from the rest of the layout to keep things efficient. And then as we swing round, uh, you can see the baseboard top is also joint because I needed it longer than the length of wood I had. Finally, at the, uh, at the left hand end or the right hand end from the rear of the layout, uh, I've added a small sector plate to allow release the locos just to save some space. Uh, this is purely a piece of ply and it's hinged on a bolt. I've just put a dowel in which allows me to rotate it. So the idea here is that there'll be three tracks coming in, one there, one there and one there, which will run down from the opposite end of the layout. And then you'll uncouple your loco and you can run it onto the sector plate and change which track you're going on, just save the space of two points and a head shunt. Obviously it's a pretty small um, sex plate, it's only about six inches long. Main reason for that is it's only going to have industrial locos on it, so it doesn't need to be the full size that a main line one would. I've added a little bit of space at the back to allow a switch to go on there so you can isolate a loco should you need to. And at the far left hand side I've just chamfered the end frame uh, to act as a buffer stop. Um, make it look hopefully neat and tidy and line up between the front and rear of the fiddle yard. And just finally on this baseboard, um, along the what is here, the rear, which will be the inside of the baseboard, so the side that is exposed on the inside of the layout to operators, I've just added a small shelf that's about a centimetre high above the baseboard edge, just so that stuff is less likely to get knocked off on this board and anyone's clothes that drag along uh, won't knock anything off. Just seemed like a, a good safety device that. The two ends on this are slightly deeper than the side frames. The side frames are 10 centimetres deep, same as the rest of the layout. And what I've done is extended that down two centimetres at each end. Now, the reason for that is that the carrying frames that are constructed uh, to hold the three scenic boards, um, this fiddle yard board is ever so slightly longer than those. And the, what happens is that this will sit across the top of those carrying frames and the slightly deeper ends sort of lock it in place, if you like, in that it can't slide off. So it's good for transit in that it'll keep this baseboard flat and level with all the others, save a bit of space um, when it comes to moving the layout around. So that's more or less it when it comes to construction of the baseboards. Um, quite a major milestone in construction of the layout, I think. There's a few sundry bits that need to be put together, such as some legs to support the curves at each end. Uh, as you can see, I'm using metal trestles for the rest of the layout. 
but I'll build those sundries as and when I require them rather than holding up progress on the rest of the layout now. As you can see, I've given the top surface of the fiddle yard a coat of white paint before I lay the track, just to make it slightly easier to see couplings when putting stock on and off the layout. In the next video, we'll start laying the track on the fiddle yard, start looking at the wiring for it and get some trains running. Until then, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please do uh, like and subscribe if you have. Make sure you don't miss any future videos in the series. And thanks for watching.